Many cases of sudden death and severe disease are being reported since the rollout of the COVID-19 gene-based vaccines. Early on, several doctors and scientists hypothesized that the COVID vaccines would lead to several complications, including autoimmune disease, blood clots, strokes, and more. Additionally, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS data, showed a strong correlation between the vaccines and adverse events. The warning signs were always there, but most of the evidence that is discussed surrounding adverse events is focused on the numbers. This many more sudden deaths, stillbirths, or cases of myocarditis, for example. So how does one determine, in an individual case, that the vaccine was the cause of death or the adverse event. It is done through pathology. An early pioneer of pathological investigations into vaccine adverse events was Professor Arne Burkhardt, a senior, highly accomplished pathologist from Germany. Professor Burkhardt came out of retirement in 2021 to examine the autopsy and biopsy materials of vaccinated patients, both living and deceased. The work of Professor Burkhart not only provided strong evidence of vaccine causation, it substantiated the professional medical hypotheses of doctors and scientists around the world. Unfortunately, in May 2023, Professor Burkhart passed away. But shortly before his death, I had the chance to interview him in his laboratory in Germany, in which he gave a detailed and compelling account of his work. During the next two hours, you will hear Professor Burkhart once more, in his own words, discuss his findings, his motivation, and what he hoped for the future of the fields of science and medicine. This is one of the few extensive English language interviews with Professor Arna Burkhart, and it is one of his last. I'm journalist Taylor Hudak, and today I'm in Reutlingen, Germany at the Laboratory of Pathologist Professor Dr. Arne Burkhardt. Professor Burkhardt is a highly esteemed pathologist with more than 50 years experience in the field. Since 2021, he has examined 75 autopsies in patients who died shortly after vaccination, as well as 41 biopsies in living persons to determine if the COVID-19 vaccinations caused either the death or disease in the patient. All right, Professor Arne Burkhart, it is my pleasure to be here in your lab today and to speak with you. I have been following your work very closely for the past year in particular. So why don't you just introduce yourself to the viewers, explain your credentials, your qualifications, as well as your contributions to the field of pathology. Well, first of all, of course, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you and uh, for those people who are interested in this uh, field. Uh, well, as, I, as you said, uh, I've been uh, in the field of pathology for many, many years now and uh, uh, many years also in scientific projects involved. Uh, the latest book has appeared in uh, just uh, last year, so uh, I think I'm still in the business, so to say. Actually, beginning of uh, 2021, I wanted to close this laboratory and go into retirement. And uh, just at that moment, the uh, uh, vaccination campaign started in Germany and it uh, only took three months. Uh, that was in March uh, 21 that uh, the first reports came to me about serious side effects and especially uh, uh, cases of people who died in timely connection with the vaccination. And uh, in most of these cases, 
Even if uh, an autopsy was performed, it was stated, well, this was a natural death. And the uh, relatives were suspicious about this and uh, they didn't accept this because uh, usually these people were very healthy before vaccination. So they contacted me and uh, other pathologists uh, about uh, a second opinion. Now, a second opinion is something very uh, usual in oncology because uh, to type a certain type of cancer, you uh, have many, sometimes many pathologists look at it and they have different opinions and so on. But in autopsy, usually the autopsy is considered something like a gold standard. Uh, if you do the autopsy and you have a result, you accept it and maybe only once a year it happened that somebody said, well, there's an autopsy and I don't believe the results, please look at it. But uh, su suddenly these were many, many uh, relatives that came to me and sometimes uh, also uh, uh, attorneys who turned uh, to me and asked if I was would be willing to do this because uh, usually many other pathologists just re refused this. and. Uh, Actually, I uh, said, well, I can look at uh, five or six cases and uh, probably everything is okay and uh, this, will, this will be it. But uh, then I received the first five cases and uh, I saw things that were very unusual. And uh, lesions that I have not, had not seen before in this context. So uh, actually, I contacted uh, other pathologists and uh, also um, uh, university institutes and ask them if they would continue this work and uh, uh, take, take over my project because actually I didn't want to do uh, and, uh, this and go into retirement. But actually uh, some uh, of the pathologists that I contacted first said, well, yes, yes, we do it and we have some support from the government for these projects and we will do it. But after a while, when uh, uh, it should have been started, they, they uh, drew back and they said, well, we don't have, want to have anything to do with it. Please uh, leave us alone. So uh, I was forced to continue my work and uh, as a consequence of our first uh, um, results. Uh, luckily, I had a second uh, experienced pathologist, Professor Lang from Hanover, who uh, helped me and who uh, was able to uh, uh, confirm what I saw. Of course, the initial diagnosis was either death caused by some natural causes or another cause. So how do you account for the discrepancy between your second opinion findings and the initial cause of death? Well, uh, as you said, there was a discrepancy in uh, almost all of the cases that we saw. Uh, the pathologist or the coroner who did the first aut the autopsy uh, claimed it was a natural cause of death or some stated it was unclear. Okay, that's uh, always a very honest diagnosis. The, the problem is that quality of autopsy as it is practiced uh, now in Germany, I think has uh, dramatically declined in the last years. When I learned pathology, this was the, the, the main focus of the Institutes of Pathology was uh, autopsy. But uh, now it's mostly biops bioptic diagnostic, which of course is also very important, but uh, pathologists have uh, lost the interest in autopsy and usually they just, uh, they are satisfied if they find something plausible as a death. So if they see a discoloration of the heart muscle, well, this, they say, well, this is an, an infarction of the heart and if the person is older than 50 years, I mean, that's al always plausible. And uh, so uh, uh, it is, uh, they no longer look for the causes behind what they see. I mean, uh, even in many cases, histology is not done. That means the uh, tissue is not examined in the microscope. 
and you cannot uh, make a diagnosis without, uh, or not uh, many diagnoses you cannot make without uh, looking at the microscope. And that's what you did. You used histopathology, is that correct? Yes. And can you explain to us what that is? We will also show these images here uh, to help explain the use of histopathology. Yes, well, first of all, um, you take a small specimen from the tissue that you want to examine, and it has to be fixed because uh, it's, uh, it's soft and uh, you cannot cut it. And you have to uh, perform uh, very thin sections, uh, thousands of millimeters thickness. And if you put them on a glass slide so they are fixed, uh, then uh, they don't have any color at all. It, only few uh, elements have color, like the red blood cells. That's why they are called red blood cells. But all the other cells are not, do not have any color. So you, you use uh, special stains uh, to make uh, uh, structures visible. And there are two, two uh, ways to do this. One is uh, that you have uh, a chemical affinity uh, of the dye and you see special structures. And the other thing is that you have antibodies that bind to certain proteins that you then see in what we call immunohistochemistry. Let's focus on this image here. This explains on the left, or it shows rather, unstained prostate gland tissue and kidney tissue. And then on the right, we see it labeled as HE stain. Can you just explain why you would use this method when examining a specimen? Well, actually, the H and E stain, which is hematoxylene eosine uh, abbreviation, uh, is a standard uh, uh, coloration or uh, stain uh, used in pathology. Uh, almost all examinations start with the H and E stain. So it's a very common practice to use this staining method. And does it help you differentiate between the different structures that you are looking at? Well, at most uh, structures, at least. I'm just showing these images to the viewers now so they can be prepared for what they are about to see as we begin discussing your own work and the images from your studies. But if we could just take a look here at this next image, this is liver tissue stained with HE. Can you just describe why it is so useful to stain a specimen again with HE? Yes, while well, you see the uh, blue points, uh, these are the nuclei, as I said, and uh, they may be enlarged or there may be multiple nuclei in a cell. And then, of course, you see the cytoplasm, which is uh, clearly red here. And you can see that uh, there may be changes there too. There may be inclusions, there may be vacuoles, there may be foreign bodies in there. So you, all this you can see. In addition to the HE stain, there are also various special staining methods that highlight specific structures and disease-related features. Here we see two examples from Professor Burkhardt's findings. In the image on the left, the Congo red stain is used to highlight a ring of amyloid within the vessel, which is a darker red color. In the image on the right, the Prussian blue stain is used to highlight iron deposits in the periphery of the vessel. Later on in this interview, Professor Burkhart will explain what the findings mean. I next asked him whether the pathologists who had performed the initial autopsies had also examined the tissue samples under the microscope. Those autopsies that were performed in uh, uh, legal institutions, uh, uh, usually no histology at all is done. Is that unusual to you? Uh, no, this has been practiced uh, uh, since the beginning of legal medicine, uh, actually, and it, uh, it is upon the uh, prosecutor if he orders histology to, to be done or not. So, of course, if there's a clear case, uh, like some, somebody has been stepped by a knife. I mean, you don't have to have a histology for that. And so the prosecutor says, well, this is OK. But uh, if, uh, the, if it is stated unclear, co uh, cause of death is unclear, then the uh, prosecutor has to decide whether histology is done or not. But 
Actually, in many cases that I have seen now, even if the uh, coroner said cause of death is unclear, no histology was ordered. In many cases, uh, toxicological uh, uh, examinations were done, especially in young people who die suddenly of unexplained causes. Uh, often drug abuse is uh, suspected. But in all of these cases that we examined, this was negative. So in your own studies, upon your second opinion, you did use the histopathology, whereas it was not done at the initial diagnosis. Yes, yes. So that accounts for the discrepancy in your second opinion compared to the initial diagnosis. Usually, yes. As I said, in uh, the uh, legal institutions uh, do not histology uh, as a routine work, but they preserve specimens. And these specimens are guarded for two or three years, and so we got these as specimens and we did the histology. Now I would like to focus on the pathological changes commonly seen in vaccinated persons. And so many of us who are not medical professionals have heard of myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle tissue. And you were able to observe this in your own studies. So I would like to now discuss these two images here. This shows on the left, normal heart muscle tissue and on the right, lymphocytic myocarditis after the vaccine. Can you explain to us the observed abnormalities that you see with the image on the right? Well, on the left side, you see the uh, muscle cells, which are elongated and have these long uh, nu nuclei. But on the right side, you see that uh, in the middle between these uh, muscle cells there are small uh, blue dots, which are the nuclei of lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are immunologically active cells and uh, apparently they have been attracted by some uh, antigenic uh, material that is in the, in the heart. Now, of course, one or two lymphocytes are always seen in a section, but uh, not uh, aggregation like that. You may compare this to uh, to the police uh, uh, controlling a city, for example. Now, if you see one policeman or policewoman, that's okay. I mean, that's uh, normal. If you see two, it's still not alarming. But if you all of a sudden you see 50 policemen, then you know there must be some trouble somewhere in the city. And that's the same in the, in the heart muscle. I mean, uh, if I see one or two lymphocytes, uh, that's normal. And they control, so to say, if there's anything wrong. But if, if they are aggregated like this in clumps, there's something wrong, and that's myocarditis. By the way, a myocarditis as a consequence of uh, a vaccination, of the so-called vaccination, is uh, now internationally recognized. I mean, this is nothing uh, that we have to uh, prove anymore. This has been proven and uh, is a, a solid uh, uh, scientific standard. Absolutely. Now, with this particular case that we are referencing here, do you know what symptoms the person had? And if not, what symptoms would you expect one to experience in a case like this? Well, the uh, main uh, uh, symptom is fatigue and physical deterioration, the necess necessity to sleep after some sportive uh, activity and physical uh, strain. So uh, actually uh, we uh, had uh, 31 cases among the 75 cases where it was stated they, were, they died of heart failure and uh, normal heart failure like uh, rhythmogenic failure and so on. And of these 31 cases, uh, actually in 15 cases there were, was a perimyocarditis uh, inflammation, and in the other 16 we saw what is called a microangiopathy, that is uh, changes in the small vessels that have, to, has, have nothing to do with arteriosclerosis, which of course is normal in older patients. So this is uh, the myocarditis. 
prior to the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccinations, when you look back on your career, how often did you see myocarditis then compared to now within the past two years? I don't think I saw myocarditis uh, more than once a year. Um, and at that time we did uh, between 1,500 uh, 1, and 2,000 autopsies a year. And uh, as I said, one or two cases a year. And uh, now uh, this is one of the most common diagnoses, in, especially in younger people. Professor Burkhart has explained that clusters of lymphocytes in heart muscle tissue indicate inflammation. A large cluster of lymphocytes is also seen in this sample of lung tissue. The sample is from an 82-year-old woman who died 40 days after receiving a second injection of the Moderna vaccine. You can see a small vessel and uh, uh, there's a lymphocytic infiltration around it, which, which is not normally in the, uh, in the lung. And so uh, this person definitely must have had some uh, uh, deficit in the gas exchange of the lung. We next discuss the case of a 70-year-old woman in whom Professor Burkhart found striking changes within the thyroid gland. A tissue sample from the woman's thyroid gland is shown on the right. On the left, we see some normal thyroid gland tissue for comparison. Well, yes, on the left side, you see the uh, what we call follicles, which contain the uh, thyroid hormone, and the hormone is uh, of course needed for the body. And uh, on the right side, you see that uh, these structures are lacking. And instead of these uh, structures, there's uh, lymphocytic infiltrations, which, which we already have seen in, in the other pictures. So uh, these lymphocytes destroy the thyroid tissue. And this is a well-known autoimmune disease, which is known for many years and it, of course, occurs without uh, vaccination. It, it's, but uh, after this vaccination, we see it more often. And in these people that we uh, saw the autopsies, in many cases, this uh, disease was not known before. So uh, it probably started or was at least uh, promoted by the vaccination. We, we ask about uh, if there were uh, symptoms before. Nobody knew anything about a, a thyroid disease in this person. So this person did not have any pre-existing condition that no. could maybe put them at risk for something like this? No. Interesting. Okay. Is this damage reversible? Once uh, the thyroid glands uh, is destroyed, this is not reversible. It, it does not have the capability of uh, uh, reconstruction. But it can be treated, of course, by giving the hormone medical treatment. The lymphocytes are a common theme among the findings discussed thus far and will continue to be discussed in subsequent cases. So how do mRNA vaccines cause lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell, to attack healthy cells? An mRNA vaccine particle consists of a modified RNA molecule, which is contained in an envelope of fat-like molecules or lipids. Once the vaccine has been injected and comes into contact with the body cells, the lipids which encase the mRNA molecule help the mRNA traverse the membrane which surrounds the cell, allowing it to enter the cell. The mRNA binds to the ribosomes within the cell, which are the cell's little protein factories. The ribosomes read the information on the mRNA and create multiple copies of the spike protein molecule. Intact spike protein molecules will transport to the cell surface, and some spike protein molecules are fragmented, and the fragments are taken to the cell surface. There, they are presented to the cells of the immune system by a specific carrier molecule called MHC1. MHC1 is the orange figure shown here. Think of MHC1 as a passport, and the antigenic peptide, or the spike protein fragment carried by MHC1, as the individual details printed within the passport, such as name and photograph. 
T lymphocytes, which happen to possess T cell receptors, which match these antigenic peptides or spike protein fragments, will recognize the MHC1 in combination with the spike protein fragments it carries and then bind to it. If a cytotoxic T cell recognizes and binds its matching antigenic peptide, then it will attack and destroy the cell which presents it. This is a necessary step in antiviral defense. However, in the context of vaccination, it is unnecessary and potentially dangerous as the immune system will attack healthy cells. Lymphocytes occur in the spleen and the lymph nodes, but are also seen in the blood. The lymphocytes are fairly small, are round, and are typically stained dark purple. If lymphocytes appear in large quantities in tissues other than the lymph nodes or the spleen, this usually means that either a viral infection or some autoimmune disease is in progress. A third possibility would be the rejection of a transplanted organ. Now we must contemplate another novel mechanism, namely the attack of the immune system on the vaccine expressing cells. The vaccines are known to enter the bloodstream shortly after injections. And this does raise questions as to how it could impact the blood vessels. So what have been your observations on this point? Well, first of all, the spike protein, which is on the one hand produced by the virus in viral infection, but on the other side is induced by the vaccination in the body. But uh, these two possibilities have completely different access to the body cells. If you have the uh, uh, viral infection, the toxic spike protein first has to pass through the epithelium and the epithelium is immunocompetent and already has the capability of detoxification and destruction of uh, harmful elements. But uh, the endothelium, which is the uh, lining of the vessels, is not an immunocompetent cell uh, uh, structure. So the toxin that is entering in the, into the blood stream and into the lymphatic vessels uh, directly hits the cells that are not able to, uh, to uh, defend themselves. So they, are, they may be destroyed. They may be de destroyed by toxic action and they may be destroyed by uh, e immunologic attack. Blood vessels are preferred targets of lymphocyte attack after vaccination. Both the large and small blood vessels can be afflicted anywhere and everywhere in the body. This is because the vaccine will distribute from the injection site to other locations in the body, mainly through the bloodstream. This image shows a dissection of the aorta, the largest blood vessel in the body. An aortic dissection is usually very rare. It is a serious condition in which a tear in the aorta allows blood to rush into the vessel wall, causing it to split or dissect. This patient was a 55-year-old male who died 21 days after the second injection. What is being observed here and why is it significant? Can you talk about this case in particular? Yeah, yes, you see a section uh, of the aorta and if you see on the left side, there's a solid wall, uh, which is a kind of yellow coloration. Yellow is the color of the elastic fibers, by the way. And then you see that there's a split formation in the middle. And then there, uh, on the right side, there are actually two walls. And in the middle, there's a, this uh, black material, which actually is blood, so there has been blood flown into this uh, dis dissected aorta. The, the me media, what we call the media of the aorta, has been destroyed and the blood has entered. And once the blood has entered there, and then the aorta may rupture and uh, the people die of uh, blood loss. I also want to look at this image from a microscopic viewpoint. So here again is the dissection of the aorta. This is the same aortic wall, but this time it is stained with HE, which we talked about earlier, and placed under a microscope. So here are the two images. Can you describe in a greater detail what we are seeing here? 
now that it's under the microscope and there's also dye applied, what can we tell about this aortic dissection? Yes, if you look, look at the left side, on top you see the uh, lumen of the uh, aorta where once the blood was flowing. Then there is the inner section of the uh, aorta and, uh, uh, and below there's a dissection and then you have uh, the uh, outer wall. Uh, so as I said, the wall is split into two. And you see the red uh, here is the uh, bleeding and then you see this uh, line of blue dots. These are inflammatory cells. And on the right side we have a higher magnification and uh, here you can see that uh, actually uh, on, on the left side you see the inner wall of the aorta and then uh, on the right side the bleeding and in the interface there is this infiltration of uh, mostly lymphocytic cells, some uh, macrophages are also there. Why do we do this? I mean uh, the the dissection of the aorta you can see by, by, uh, without the microscope, but of course a dissection of the aorta may have different causes. And uh, one is, uh, in older person, the arteriosclerosis. But if you look here, uh, on the left side again, you don't see any, any sign of arteriosclerosis here. So you were able to rule that out as the cause? I can rule this out. Okay. The second thing that has to be ruled out is the genetic defect of uh, uh, the uh, uh, connective tissue, which may lead to this uh, type of uh, aortic rupture. It appears in, in younger persons, and uh, this usually does not go along with any uh, significant inflammatory infiltrates. So the inflammatory infiltrates prove in this case that it is not a genetic defect. And we can further make this uh, plausible because we did the immunohistochemistry for the spike protein and it's, it is selectively located in these areas. So this is an additional proof. Just to tie it all together, I want to make note that this methodology that you use was not used during the initial autopsies. Is that correct? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Before the rollout mm -hmm. or implementation of the COVID-19 vaccines, how common was an aortic dissection? As I said, we did uh, about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 uh, autopsies a year. And uh, I might say it might have been one or two a year at that time. And in this series of 75 uh, autopsies that we have re-examined, uh, we saw five uh, ruptures of the aorta with uh, uh, consecutive deaths. And uh, actually, in those cases where histology from the aorta was taken, smaller areas of dissection, especially loss of the elastic fibers, I think we come to this later, uh, uh, can be proven in many, many cases, in almost all cases. Some of these findings are minimal. Okay. So we know that the COVID-19 vaccines induce blood clotting, and this was predicted by several doctors and scientists before the COVID-19 vaccines were made available to the general public. And these two images here, which are not from your own studies, but from a general archive or published studies, show vasculitis, which is inflammation of the blood vessels, and that can induce blood clotting. So can you just explain for us uh, what is being observed in these uh, two images and in particular what staining method was used? When you describe this here, it's going to help provide a better context for the listeners as we begin to discuss images from your own studies. On the left side, you see the standard H and E stain and you see this uh, circular structure which is a little bit uh, more uh, red, uh, that's the inside of the vessel and it's a thrombus formation. And you can see where the, where the uh, arrow is, uh, you can see that the endothelium is destroyed. So one of our main results, uh, we stated that the endothelial damage is one of the main causes of the complications. What happens if you have endothelial damage? 
Well, if the endothelium is damaged and discarded into the vessel lumen, then uh, the uh, basement membrane and the uh, extracellular matrix of the vessel wall is exposed to the blood. And as soon as this happens, uh, the body wants to heal this and the, the thrombocytes come and the thrombocytes are those that initiate a, a thrombus formation. So thrombus formation actually is a normal healing process. And in this case, healing process of damage that has been triggered by the vaccine. Okay. And then if you would like to go ahead and, and describe for us the image on the right, and I believe that immunohistochemistry yes. was used in, in this image because we see different colors. We see some brown, some black even. If you could just describe what is being observed here. Well, you, you see these uh, brown uh, staining and uh, this is uh, fibrin. So besides thrombocytes, fibrin is the main component of, uh, of uh, thrombus. And uh, so we can actually prove that in this case there's a thrombus formation. And that means a, a blood clot? Yeah, that's a blood clot, yes. Okay. Continuing with our discussion on the blood vessels, there has been evidence of lymphocytic inflammation of the small blood vessels. Here we have an image from Dr. Michael Mertz. Can you explain to us uh, the differences we see here from the image on the left, which is a normal small blood vessel, compared to the image on the right, which is a blood vessel attacked by the lymphocytes? What, what observed differences do you see? Well, actually, on the left side, you see this uh, small vessel, and uh, inside there are these red dots, uh, which are uh, red blood cells, and uh, then you can see these uh, elongated, spindle-shaped uh, nuclei that form something like a wallpaper uh, outlining uh, and protecting the, the vessel. And uh, if these are destroyed, as I said before, then a, a thrombosis might happen. And on the right side, actually, you see this uh, uh, microthrombus, uh, which um, usually mainly contains thrombocytes and some fibrin. And uh, which, uh, very important, you see that uh, instead of the uh, normal myofibroblasts that uh, form the vessel wall, there's an infiltration of inflammatory cells. Now, these next two images and cases that we will discuss are from your own studies in which you observed vasculitis of the small blood vessels in the brain. This is now the second time that we mentioned vasculitis, so just a reminder for everybody listening, that is an inflammation of the blood vessels. If you could again, for us, just describe what is being observed in these two images here. Yes, well, actually, uh, this is one of the most alarming findings. Uh, that we had from the beginning on, that if you really look closely at these, uh, at the brain tissue sections, you find this uh, vasculitis in almost all cases. In many cases, it's a very discreet, but you have to look for it. And uh, these are two images where you can see, you really have to look closely to see that this, these uh, uh, small vessels in the brain uh, uh, there's, the endothelium is swollen, but uh, then there are these small uh, uh, blue dots. These, again, are lymphocytes, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, aggregate uh, around these uh, small vessels. And, and lymphocytes and cause inflammation. The uh, fact that lymphocytes are found there means that uh, there's uh, some inflammation probably triggered by some antigenic structure, in this case, maybe, maybe a spike protein or something uh, from the vaccination. And uh, as I said, these, this is a finding that uh, in minimal degree is uh, found in almost all of these people who died after vaccination. And actually, we, we have seen it also in one uh, needle biopsy from the brain. We right. come to this we later. Will. And uh, in many of these cases, which have uh, more pronounced uh, inflammation of the uh, uh, vessels of the brain, there, there have been transient uh, uh, defects like loss of speech for a few hours, uh, unconsciousness for some hours, blindness for some hours. 
uh, it, it, uh, the brain is, is if, if there's no major uh, inflammation and no uh, um, hemorrhage, uh, these people, uh, the, the brain is able to compensate again. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, this uh, is a, a very uh, striking um, side effect. So just in order for me to summarize what you had just said, this finding here was one of the most concerning. Yes. It is also one that is very commonly seen in people who have died post-vaccination. Yes. And it can, oftentimes individuals with this complication have had periods of blindness, inability to speak properly. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Now, uh, uh, just to, yeah. uh, to get this clear, I mean, they did not die from this. This, okay. this, uh, this is something we find. Uh, we find other cases where there's blood bleeding and, and, and hemorrhage in the, in the mm -hmm. brain and they died of it. But this is just a side effect mm -hmm. which may be compensated and healed to a certain degree. So somebody who is listening right now or anybody could have receive the COVID-19 vaccine, they could have this very issue, experience some symptoms and not even know that they are experiencing yes. this? Yes, exactly. And uh, actually in some cases, uh, uh, change in, in the character of these uh, vaccinated is reported. Sometimes it's a rever reversible and apparently in some cases not. And this may be one of the reasons. In addition to lymphocytic inflammation, Professor Burkhart also found other forms of damage to small blood vessels. These three images show lesions of these small blood vessels in the brain and heart. Images A and C show these small vessels from the brain of an 87-year-old woman who died 302 days after receiving a second Pfizer vaccine. Image B shows these small vessels from the heart muscle tissue of an 81-year-old woman who died 23 days after receiving one dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So if you could just go ahead and describe what we are seeing in these three images. Well, in all three images, you see lesions of the blood vessels, of the smaller blood vessels. And uh, on the left side, this is a, a small vessel from the brain. And in this case, uh, there's uh, no major inflammation, but we have this blue stain and the blue stain means iron deposition. And iron is deposited where there has been uh, bleeding before. So the erythrocytes contain iron and it is uh, uh, deposited in the uh, tissue uh, as what we call hemosiderin. And hemosiderin is a very strong indication of uh, uh, bleeding uh, in, in this vessel wall. Now this person at this point at least was uh, uh, lucky because this bleeding was stopped within the vessel wall and it did not go outside into the brain tissue. And if you look at the right side, again this is uh, from the brain and uh, this is a stain uh, which we call Congo red, but it stains especially the elastic fibers and usually uh, as these small vessels are surrounded, completely surrounded by elastic fibers so that they, uh, that they will not rupture. And you can see that in this part it is there, there are elastic fibers. Now they are also not normal, they are clumped together and uh, discontinuous, but in this part they are completely lacking and you see that the, the, the small vessel has a, what we call an aneurysm. And now this, this of course could rupture at any time because there's no uh, elastic lamella anymore which, contain, which may contain it. And in the middle you see that uh, also the small vessels in the uh, heart muscle are affected and in this case the endothelium is uh, uh, swollen and uh, there has been a deposition of uh, some acellular uh, red stained material which is apparently related to what we call amyloid and uh, in some cases also related to uh, prions. And uh, th these are proteins that uh, may be derived from the spike protein and uh, the, the 
deleterious effect is that the body cannot get rid of them. They, they are not uh, digestible by, uh, by macrophages or other inflammatory cells. The image in the middle, it is labeled amyloid protein deposits. Can you yes. just explain what that is? Well, this is uh, this uh, strange type of uh, um, protein. It's a misfolded protein which by this uh, unnatural uh, structure cannot be disintegrated by the body. Mm -hmm. And so it remains in the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, there's a certain disease, amyloidosis, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, very rare and develops after many years of infections and something like that. But we find similar uh, proteinaceous uh, deposits in after vaccination, and uh, they have a different. They are probably not identical, but they are related to it. And that's why we call it amyloid-like. Now, how do these changes to the blood vessels affect organ function? Well, if you look at the middle picture, of course, you can see that this small vessel is practically occluded. I mean, there's maybe one third only open. So, of course, if you have some uh, trouble with perfusion of the myocardium uh, and these small vessels are occluded in many uh, areas, then uh, you might actually die of a heart failure. Mm -hmm. But this is not a heart failure by uh, arteriosclerosis or something like that, but it's, it's a in the, in the larger sense, what we call uh, small vessel disease. Small vessel disease is also uh, detected in some cases of intoxication with other materials, and in this case, apparently, it's a spike protein. In this next case, Professor Burkhart observed a subarachnoid hemorrhage in a 29-year-old male who received one dose of AstraZeneca and one dose of Pfizer. He died 46 days after the second injection. Most cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage arise from structural defects of brain vessels, most often aneurysms. However, no such defects were found in this case, nor did the patient have any other known illnesses. First of all, before we discuss the image from your study, can you just explain briefly what a subarachnoid hemorrhage is? Well, the, the brain is covered by a very delicate uh, uh, kind of a skin, uh, and uh, there are, in, inside there are uh, small vessels uh, which also supply the, the brain. And in this image, actually, this is the surface of the brain. You see the surface of the brain here, and there's this uh, very delicate uh, structure, which is the subarachnoidal membrane with uh, a small vessel here. And then we have the, uh, the brain groove here, and uh, here a little bit larger vessel is shown and you can see that the vessel wall, if you would look at it at a high magnification, is dissolved and you can see that there's blood also in the uh, surrounding of this vessel. So this vessel a apparently is not uh, containing the blood anymore, but there's a hemorrhage. And in this uh, patient, no larger aneurysm was found because this type of uh, uh, sub subarachnoidal bleeding usually occurs or may, may occur in younger persons, but it is uh, caused by genetic defect in the larger vessels of the brain basis. And this was not the case in this patient. It was not found. So he had a diffuse uh, uh, hemorrhage from inflamed and partly destroyed smaller vessels. Do you know what symptoms that he may have had? And if not, what symptoms would one experience if they were suffering with this particular condition? Would they have any symptoms? Well, actually, this was one of these cases. Uh, he was suddenly unconscious and uh, reanimation was done in the hospital, but he died. Uh, actually, they could not. Did he die suddenly? So, yes, actually. Excuse me. Sure. Before he was unconscious, he had convulsions. Okay. 
uh, and uh, after that, and he was uh, resuscitated and uh, died in the hospital, and then came dead to the hospital. At age 29, otherwise healthy male? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, what persuaded you to conclude that it was possible that it was the COVID-19 vaccine that was perhaps associated with this death, this ailment? Well, actually, in addition to these uh, lesions in the brain, we found uh, uh, mild myocarditis also, mm. which would be very unusual that you have a brain uh, hemorrhage and uh, myocarditis, and we had uh, endothelial lesions, uh, damage and destruction of endothelium, especially not, also, not only in the brain, as I showed you, but also in the myocardium. So this is a apparently toxic effect and uh, this uh, the assumption that this is a toxic effect uh, mediated by uh, the spike protein is uh, made further uh, very probable because we could uh, show the spike protein in these lesions and by the way this is the person where we found the spike protein in the testis in the spermatogenic uh, um, Cells. Yes, and we will get to that, but I just want to speak generally here. You are able to find several abnormalities in one patient. Yes. And what does that suggest to you? Well, that would suggest that he did not die of a brain aneurysm, but he died of uh, multiple lesions, which probably are caused by the same, in this case, toxic agent. Thank you. I now want to have you take a look here at some of the findings from German Swedish pathologist Jute Kruger. I think it's important to highlight that there are other pathologists as well who are yes. who are doing this work who are seeing the same abnormalities. So I'd just like you to provide a comment on what's being shown here and its implications. Well, uh, actually, this is exactly what we see too. On on the left, there's a normal artery. I mean. Uh, it's, it's an H and E stain, so you don't see the elastic fibers. If you would have a, an elastic stain, you would see some defects there. And here you can see the uh, inflammatory infiltration in the intimal part of the vessel. And uh, there's no endothelium here to see, to be seen. And if there's no endothelium, then thrombo a thrombus is formed. How are you able to determine if these lesions, which are tissue abnormalities, are a result of the COVID-19 vaccine or the COVID virus? The pathogenic agent is in both cases uh, identical, and uh, especially the spike protein, of course, is induced by the vaccination, and the spike protein is also produced by the virus. So the uh, levels of the spike protein is uh, very much lower in viral infected persons in contradistinction to those who have been vaccinated. And actually nobody knows how high these uh, concentrations of the spike protein can be in, in uh, the vaccinated. And uh, of course we know it can persist for many months now and can be found in all organs while in the normal infection it usually stays limited to the uh, aerodigestic uh, tract. And uh, uh, in addition to the spike protein, of course, the uh, true viral infection has other antigenic uh, structures. And one of these anti other antigenic structures is uh, the nucleocapside. And, uh, so if we find uh, the spike protein and the nucleocapside, then it is probably the result of a true inf viral infection. But if we find only spike protein and uh, no nucleocapside, this is a very strong suggestion that this is a consequence of the uh, vaccination. How do we know that the spike protein expression is caused by the vaccination and not the virus? To best understand this, it is important to note that SARS-CoV-2 virus particles contain two major proteins. First, the spike protein, which is located at the surface of the virus particle. And second, 
the nucleocapsid protein, which forms a protective layer around the RNA genome. Therefore, virus-infected cells should make both of these proteins. Meanwhile, the vaccine only encodes the spike protein and not the nucleocapsid protein. This has been experimentally confirmed by German physician Dr. Michael Mertz. How can we determine whether the spike protein and or the nucleocapsid protein had been present in the patient's tissues? We can use immunohistochemistry or IHC. This method allows for the detection of specific molecules of interest in the tissue samples by using specific antibodies. In this case, the molecules of interest are the spike protein or the nucleocapsid, respectively. We will here use the spike protein as the example. Let's now summarize this technique. First, an antibody which interacts with the molecule of interest, in this case the spike protein, is applied to the tissue sample. After allowing some time for the antibody to bind to its target, the unbound surplus is washed off. Next, a secondary antibody coupled with a catalytic protein enzyme is applied to the same tissue sample. This second antibody binds to the first one. After some more time, the unbound surplus is again washed off. Third, a colorless dye precursor, most often diaminobenzidine, is added to the sample. This dye precursor can be converted to an actual dye by the enzyme that is attached to the second antibody, and thus indirectly to the spike protein. The brown dye that is produced by the enzyme is insoluble, so it comes out of solution and is deposited close by. Thus, wherever there are deposits of brown pigment, we know that spike protein must have been present. We can perform the same procedure separately with an antibody that specifically recognizes the nucleocapsid. And now we're going to focus on the use of immunohistochemistry to detect vaccine-induced expression of the spike protein. Here we have uh, two images, and these images come from Dr. Michael Mertz, and they show the cross sections through two small blood vessels. Can you explain what is being observed here? Yes, I, I think these pictures illustrate exactly what I just uh, tried to explain. I mean, you see on the, uh, okay. on, on the top, you see small vessels. And uh, already from this magnification, you can see that this, these vessels have uh, an endothelial damage. Then you have the brown stain, and that means that uh, immunohistochemically spike protein can be uh, seen here. Below, the same vessels are seen, uh, and uh, they are stained for nuclear capsite. And uh, you see the same lesions, of course, of the endothelium, but there's no staining. So this is a very strong indication. In considering everything that you see that this is a specific lesion uh, by the vaccine uh, produced a spike protein and not by the virus uh, produced a spike protein. In each of the cases, did you perform nucleocapsid control? In all the cases that we have a positive spike protein reaction, we do the nucleocapsid with negative and positive controls. And if the spike protein is negative, of course, then we don't have to do the uh, nuclear capsid because uh, this, uh, this uh, is not uh, relevant anymore. And, and actually we have, uh, I think, two or three cases where we do have uh, expression of uh, the nuclear capsid. So mm -hmm. uh, in these cases, of course, you, uh, there might be an additive effect of the vaccination and a viral infection either before or after vaccination. And in our observation, these are the cases with the most uh, severe side effects. When somebody has been infected and then also was vaccinated, yeah, no, you see the most yes, severe, no, no, most yes, severe yes. We symptoms. Can, we cannot prove this scientifically uh, by now, but this is just uh, case uh, observation. Thank you. That is a, a very important uh, point that you, you raise here. While detection of spike protein clearly points to vaccine causation, Professor Burkhart does not rely on this method alone.
Let me stress this, uh, we never make this diagnosis just solely, uh, only dependent on our immunohistochemistry. We only make this diagnosis if we have lesions which are distinctly positive and by, which by themselves are already more or less absolutely uh, typical of vaccination damage like uh, uh, elastica destruction. This next image shows the expression of spike protein in the coronary artery of a 24-year-old male with no known prior illnesses. The young man received one dose of Johnson & Johnson and one dose of Pfizer. He died 56 days after the second injection. Can you just describe the significance of this, of this image? Well, you see the vessel wall on the left lower corner, and then you see the split in the middle. And here you can see a dense uh, infiltration of lymphocytes. These are the small dark dots. And uh, then you can hear this is a thrombus. Uh, and we did the spike protein and it, it is positive in some of these inflammatory cells. And uh, maybe we are not very sure what it means in the, in the thrombus, but uh, it, it, this might be an artifact. And this, by the way, is, is an artifact too. But given that this image shows a lot of brown pigmentation, does that mean that there is a lot of spike protein being observed here? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, here, should, uh, here in, the, in this line sh should have been the endothelium, mm -hmm. protect, protecting the blood, which has been flown here, and mm -hmm. this is the wall. And here the endothelium should have made a borderline between the two, and it is destroyed. There's uh, inflammatory infiltration, and in, in this context also some trom thrombocytes have been attached, and then the process of thrombotic event was started. What role did the spike protein have in the formation of the blood clot here? Well, it's, it's the endothelial damage. It's a destruction of the endothelium whether it's by toxic or by uh, immunologic uh, uh, interaction. I don't, uh, it's not clear in every case, but it, in any case, uh, th there's no endothelium here. Okay. It's just like that. It is now well established that there is an increased risk of myocarditis after vaccination. Professor Burkhart further established in this particular case that the severe myocarditis observed in the patient was spike protein induced. The patient was a 54-year-old woman who died 11 days after receiving a second Pfizer injection. I'll let you just uh, describe here what, what we are able to see. Well, on the left side, of course, you see a uh, heart muscle with uh, very pronounced disintegration and destruction of muscle cells. And uh, there's a dense infiltration, again, of these small dots that are the lymphocytes. And uh, in contradistinction to uh, an uh, infarction, uh, there are no neutrophile granulocytes, in which are the cells that are predominant in a myocardial infarction. And on the right side, it is just shown that the spike protein is uh, uh, found in these destroyed uh, uh, muscle cells. In this case, the uh, autopsy done by the pathologist was uh, death by cardiac decompensation, which of course uh, contains everything. I mean, uh, it, it is not a uh, an etiological uh, diagnosis. It's just a, a, a statement of uh, a plausible cause of death. Another pathologist, Dr. Michael Mertz, is also using immunohistochemical staining to detect spike protein in the tissues of vaccinated persons. These two images are from Dr. Mertz's published study in which he examined the brain tissue of a vaccinated patient who developed myocarditis and encephalitis post-injection. The patient was a 76-year-old male who had received one dose of AstraZeneca and two doses of Pfizer. He died three weeks after the third injection. Would you like to just comment on, on what is being observed here? On the left, we see the spike, and then on the right, we see the nucleocapsid control. 
Well, yes, you see uh, the brain tissue and uh, the larger cellular elements are uh, the nerve cells. And uh, on the left side, you see a positive uh, staining, in this case, uh, brown staining of some of these uh, neural elements. And on the right side, again, a negative finding. So this is a strong indication that uh, these uh, damages are caused by this uh, uh, vaccine-induced spike protein. So just to reiterate one more time for the listeners, the nucleocapsid control, which is being shown here on the right, indicates in this case that the expression of the spike protein was caused by the COVID-19 vaccination and not the COVID-19 virus. Yes. Okay. This in the context of the whole... In the context, again... Of, of, the... of all findings and all clinical data, yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. Now we can have a discussion about uh, encephalitis, and I want to talk about a case in which a brain biopsy was done. And to be honest, I was very surprised by this particular case because I did not know that one could have a brain biopsy. From my understanding, it's done very rarely. So can you talk about why in this case a brain biopsy was done on this particular individual? Well, actually, uh... A needle biopsy of brain lesions uh, actually is uh, something that yes, is, it's, must be very rare because I have in 40 years I have not uh, had a, a needle biopsy of the brain. What I did have is uh, uh, fast frozen sections during open op uh, surgery of the, mm -hmm. of the brain, of course, if they sure. open the, uh, the, the, the brain and uh, find a tumor or something, and then they make a, a fast frozen section to get the diagnosis during, op during the surgery. But in this case, she had uh, Severe uh, neurological symptoms, uh, they, of course, they did investigate the uh, spinal fluid and everything, but they did not come to a conclusion. So uh, there was a suggestion of a tumor in the brain, and they suspected a malignant lymphoma. And a malignant lymphoma can be very successfully treated if you know the exact type. So they were desperate to uh, find out what type of a lymphoma was here to give her the right treatment. But then they did the, uh, this uh, needle biopsy and uh, no uh, tumor, no uh, cancer was found. Uh, this has been affirmed, uh, uh, confirmed by uh, several uh, university pathologists who looked at it. But instead, they found a very pronounced uh, vasculitis and also a, a concomitant uh, encephalitis. On the left side, you see this. Uh, this is the needle, uh, the contents of the needle that was used to get the tissue out of the brain. And on the right side, you see a high ma magnification and also in this uh, Overview, you can see these uh, spots where there's a more dense aggregation of cells. These are inflammatory cells and they are located selectively around uh, small vessels. So this is uh, definitely a vasculitis, a lymphocytic vasculitis, and also some inflammation in the surrounding tissue uh, could be found. So uh, there was also a concomitant uh, encephalitis. Malignant lymphoma was excluded and uh, vasculitis and encephalitis was confirmed and uh, I suppose she is treated now for probably for with uh, some anti-inflammatory agents. Professor Burkhart also tested this same brain biopsy sample for the spike protein using immunohistochemistry. On the left side, you see the spike protein, and it is selectively expressed in the uh, uh, vessel walls of the small vessel. It's uh, brown stained, and uh, there's not much background in this uh, case. And uh, on the right side, uh, you see the nucleocapsid, which is uh, absolutely negative in this case. And in the middle, you can see that these uh, large Nerve cells also express the spike protein, so this is an indication of a concomitant uh, encephalitis. Michael Mertz was also able to find in his case study of a 76-year-old man 
uh, he found that this individual who was also vaccinated had encephalitis as well. So is encephalitis potentially a, a common ailment associated with COVID-19 vaccination? Well, uh, apparently, yes. Uh, as I said, we find uh, uh, minor lesions of the uh, small vessels. And uh, if the small vessels or if the vessels are uh, inflamed, uh, the so-called uh, blood-brain barrier breaks down. And that means that the uh, uh, vaccine uh, contents can uh, enter into the brain. and. Uh, I think just recently some Japanese uh, investigators found that uh, the spike protein is uh, selectively toxic for uh, ganglion cells, for nerve cells. Once it gets into the brain, it uh, may uh, cause uh, encephalitis. This image shows the strong expression of spike protein within the spleen of a 94-year-old female who died 67 days after the second injection. Spike protein expression in the spleen is notable for two reasons. Firstly, we know that vaccine particles tend to accumulate in the spleen. Secondly, it is a major lymphatic organ. Spike protein expression in the spleen may therefore result in the killing of many lymphocytes, which would in turn lead to immunosuppression. Can you explain what is being observed here with this case? And why does the spleen show such strong expression of the spike, spike protein? Well, actually, of course, this is uh, one of the aims of the, uh, uh, of the vaccination. They want to provoke the immune system to produce uh, uh, spike protein. But uh, in this case, it was a very strong expression and not only in the spleen. I just uh, took this picture to show that uh, the vaccination does what it should do, but it does too much. It's, uh, uh, in some cases, it's, it's what we call uh, lymphocytic amok. Yes, this is a, f a f term or phrase that you have coined, really. You coined the term uh, lymphocyte amok. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I mean that uh, the lymphocytes are uh, overstimulated. Uh, I mean, the, the vaccination wants to stimulate them, of course, but in some cases they are overstimulated. And uh, clinicians talk about hyperinflammatory syndrome, I'm, and this may be destructive in many organs. And uh, this always has a danger of an autoimmune disease, which we talked about earlier, about the thyroiditis and so on. So how serious is immunosuppression, for example, and how does it typically present itself in patients who may be sh suffering from it? Uh, immunosuppression is something that is not conspicuous in our cases because we see overstimulation like in this picture and sometimes we see depletion of the spleen and, and lymph nodes. But of course, uh, by the morphological structures, we cannot uh, make any uh, statement about the state of the uh, uh, immune system. Okay. So this next case involves a 35-year-old woman who was vaccinated and started to experience skin lesions. And this has had a severe impact on her life. I have heard you speak about uh, her case publicly before. Can you just explain for us uh, what this woman was experiencing and how this impacted her quality of life? Well, first of all, she had several uh, severe side effects, but uh, the one side effect that affects her or uh, reduces her quality of life the most is the, are these skin lesions. She had an absolutely healthy skin before, and now she does not want to enter into the uh, swimming pool or in the uh, open. And uh, actually, uh, the whole skin is covered with these uh, pustular lesions. And uh, we took a biopsy, and uh, you can see on the left side, mm -hmm that this is uh, something that is uh, related to what we call a lichen, lichen planus, that is an autoimmune disease destroying the uh, basal cells. And you can see that uh, here 
these uh, cells are specifically stained by the spike protein and they are vacuolated. That means they are, they are damaged or even dead. And then you can see the spike protein also in this lymphocytic infiltrate. The lymphocytic infiltrate is the one that attacks the basal cell. So you did find uh, the spike protein expressed in the skin biopsy. So I do want to ask you, could skin biopsies also be useful in potential vaccine damage to organs other than the skin? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, I said this is a lesion that is uh, related to what is known as uh, lichen planus, but uh, it is an atypical uh, type because in addition to these uh, destructions of the uh, epidermis, we also find a vasculitis. And this is not a typical feature of uh, this disease lichen planus. So we have an atypical autoimmune disease with concomitant uh, vasculitis. And uh, we get uh, a lot of uh, skin biopsies now with a question. And there are two different types of questions. Uh, one are the persons that have uh, lesions of the skin. Mm -hmm. And there we find atypical lichen planus and uh, what is called pemphogites uh, lesions, which are uh, autoimmune diseases. They have lesions of the skin. But then we have other persons that do not have any skin lesions, but other uh, uh, side effects. And here we find this uh, vasculitis of the skin. And this is very, uh, very clear. And it is also so associated with spike protein expression in the endothelium. So there is, are these two possibilities. Many women have experienced and reported on menstrual disruptions post-vaccination and you have been able to see this in your own studies. In particular, there was one woman, a 52-year-old woman, who was still having a menstrual cycle. And post-vaccine, she began to experience very heavy bleeding. These three images here are showing the tissue of the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus. And I see that on the right, we do see the nucleocapsid control, which is important because, again, that is able to indicate that the expression of the spike protein here is a result of the COVID-19 vaccine and not the virus, but I'll let you take it from here. What are we seeing in these three images? Well, uh, first of all, let me add uh, this uh, fact. This woman not only had these disastrous bleeding problems, but she also had other very severe side effects, uh, neurologically, uh, uh, blood perfusion and so on. She, she's really uh, very sick, but nobody took uh, her seriously. So uh, this uh, uh, abrasio was done. And uh, you, we can see here uh, on the left side, we see the uh, glands of the endometrium. And uh, you can see that the uh, epithelial cells are positively stained. The background, the stroma, what we call it, is negative. So this is an indication that this is a specific stain. And also in this case, the uh, uh, nuclear cap capsite is uh, negative. Now what you see here, this is, uh, these are uh, uh, red blood cells, these are vessels. So this is not an immunohistochemical staining. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is very striking, and I have never seen this before, and I looked into textbooks, about uh, the formation of lympho follicles, uh, small lympho no lymph nodes, so to say, in the endometrium. And uh, there are some references to lymphoplasmocytic uh, uh, endometritis, but uh, I didn't find the term lymphonodular uh, uh, endometritis. And actually, we find, uh, I think, even non-pathologists may see that this is a small nodule here of dense uh, aggregated cells. Mm -hmm. These are lymphocytes. And uh, this you would call a lymph follicle. And in the middle here, you can see these stained. And there's a gland. And this gland, gland expresses a spike protein. So actually, we have the uh, autoimmune attack in flagranti here uh, in, in the endometrium. Great explanation there. So this, what we're seeing in the middle image, you say is, is highly unusual, yes. what you just described. Okay. Yes. And uh, 
the excess bleeding that this woman had experienced, that is attributable to the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, uh, I think this is a, a very strong case. I mean, why would she have, uh, of course it could be menopausal bleeding, but uh, as I said, she uh, has other very strong symptoms, uh, side effects. Lymphocytic inflammation and spike expression is also observed in the testis. The image on the left, stained with HE, is from a 55-year-old male who died seven days after receiving a second Pfizer injection. The image on the right shows spike protein expression in the spermatogonia, which are the cells that produce sperm. This sample is from a 29-year-old male who died 46 days after his second injection. As discussed earlier, the immediate cause of his death was a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Well, first of all, on the left side, you see a distinct uh, lymphocytic nodule forming around the blood vessel. And uh, so this is uh, uh, lymphocytic vasculitis, and uh, this is a section from the testis. And on the right side, you can see the spermatogenic tubules of the testis. And you can see uh, that the stratification usually is very regular and you can see it is disturbed. And uh, usually in the middle, in the lumen, there should be uh, uh, lots of spermatocytes. And you can see a few spermatocytes here. These are the more, very small uh, elements, but uh, uh, what is conspicuous is that uh, these larger elements, which are the spermatogonia with the uh, cells that form the, the uh, uh, sperms, uh, are detached in, in the lumen of these small canals. The image on the right side, labeled spike protein, do you see sperm cells in this image here? If you look exactly, uh, you can find one or two in one of these canals, but uh, usually there should be at least uh, 20 or 30 of even okay. more. Usually it's filled. Okay. And especially the stratification is completely destroyed. Would you expect someone to have symptoms if they were to be experiencing this complication? Well, I wouldn't think that they have any uh, dramatic uh, symptoms, but uh, probably sexual uh, activity would be lowered because it is connected with the spermatocyte production. And by the way, we also found, find expression in, of spike protein in the prostate gland. So this is also part of the semen. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it should be affected, but probably uh, not everybody would uh, take a record of this. Mm -hmm. During a recent speech in Stockholm, you said that you would recommend a woman of childbearing age to not become pregnant by a man who has been vaccinated. Can you expand further on, on what you meant by that? Well, actually, uh, I wanted to add something, but I was uh, interrupted by uh, a big applause to yes. this. <laughs> if I may make a personal comment, uh, this is not a scientific comment. Uh, if I were a woman in fertile age, I would not plan a motherhood from a person, from a man who has been vaccinated, unless... I think these pictures are very disturbing, very disturbing for me. And I said, unless, and uh, then I stopped, and uh, I get uh, many telephone calls of uh, women who say, well, what did you say, unless what? Yeah, so right now, why don't you tell us, what else are you going to say well, at I, that moment? I would at least uh, wait uh, for two or three cycles of spermatogenesis. Now, the cycle of spermatogenesis is about 70 days, so... Uh, uh, it's, I would wait for, let's say, uh, two, uh, well, three quarters of a year or something like that. And uh, before this, I would uh, suggest to make a spermatogram. 
uh, examine this, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, sperma and uh, especially the mortality, the uh, mortality of the sperma. So uh, I think this would be an indication. Now, as far as I can, I have seen, uh, and I have not only seen the uh, uh, testes of this young man, but also of old, uh, older men. But of course, they are more difficult to uh, interpret. But uh, as far as I can see, the spermatocytes themselves do not express the uh, spike protein, as far as I know by now. Anyhow, this is, this is of course an uh, alarming finding. Sure. And according to data submitted by Pfizer to the Japanese health regulator, the vaccine particles do distribute to the ovaries. But in your own studies, were you able to find spike protein expression in the ovaries? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, we did find this. Unfortunately, uh, these are mo mostly elderly women where we get uh, specimens from the ovary. Unfortunately, uh, uh, during autopsy, the ovaries are often not uh, taken uh, for uh, histological examination. So uh, this has to be interpreted very uh, cautiously. Uh, we find it actually mostly in the uh, vessels, in the uh, vessel walls of the ovary. But uh, we, we are behind this question. Professor Burkhart, a few times throughout this interview, we did mention the elastic fiber. So that is now what I would like to focus on. And you have been able to show that there is damage to the elastic fibers caused by the COVID-19 vaccines. But before we discuss some of the images, I would like you to describe uh, in simple terms the function of elastic fibers in the body. Well, actually, the elastic fibers uh are a very late uh, development in uh, the evolution of uh, life. And uh, uh, these are structures that, uh, like a rubber band, uh, have elasticity. And these fibers are formed in the first years of the life. And uh, around pub puberty, uh, uh, no more or only very little elastic fibers are formed anymore. So it's a permanent structure. It's very important for uh, the arteries, especially the main artery, the aorta, uh, because it gives elasticity. It is important in the lung because it gives elasticity in breathing. Uh, and it is also important in the skin because it gives uh, the uh, baby face appearance baby of, of, appearance. of uh, the skin. And uh, if you get older, these uh, elastic fibers of the skin are destroyed by ultraviolet uh, variation. So that's uh, why we look older when we get old. But uh, there have been uh, very convincing reports that people after the vaccination suddenly appear to look much older. Now, this may be due to psychological factors too, but uh, uh, we definitely have proof that these elastic fibers, in some cases, are profoundly destroyed in the skin. And uh, the other uh, organ that is uh, 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 very important in view of elasticity is uh, are the arteries. I mean, the uh, heart contracts and there's a rise in pressure. And this pressure is uh, taken up by the elasticity. So the, the uh, uh, blood pressure is not uh, going up uh, uh, indefinitely, but it is uh, taken up and then when the heart is not contracting, uh, the, uh, the arteries flow the blood to, uh, blood to the uh, organs. The walls of the aorta and of other major arteries are rich in elastic fibers, which are arranged into stacked layers or lamella. These elastic lamella are essential for the vessel's ability to withstand the pulsating blood pressure. Professor Burkhardt found that in many of his cases, the elastic lamella were damaged and disrupted, particularly within the hot spots of inflammation. If 
the uh, arteries are not elastic, we would have uh, uh, peaks in the blood pressure and this Peaks, of course, lead, may lead to rupture, and uh, we already, to already talked about uh, rupture of uh, uh, arteries in the brain in the aorta. Damage to the aorta and to other major arteries was also apparent in patients who had not suffered overt failure or rupture to these vessels. This image shows the aortic wall of a 29-year-old male who died 67 days after receiving the second Pfizer injection. The tissue sample has been treated with a special stain which highlights the disrupted elastic lamella. The image on the left shows intact elastic lamella for a comparison. Can you describe what we are viewing here and the significant findings related to the elastic fibers? Yes, well on the left side you see that uh, the normal arteries, especially the aorta, the main uh, artery of the body, is uh, constructed of a very regular stratification of uh, uh, myofibroblastic cells and uh, smooth muscle cells and uh, these elastic fibers. This is very important and we have very alarming uh, findings. First of all, destruction of elastic fibers in the arteries, especially in the aorta. Sometimes very small lesions. You don't see this in the in a radiograph. Patients with these lesions don't have any symptoms, but mm -hmm. those that have further development, which have a total uh, media necrosis of the elastic fibers, they may die of uh, aortic rupture. And we have, as I said, five cases of this. Can you explain in simple terms what media necrosis is? or how it would present itself? Well, uh, especially the larger arteries, especially the main artery of the body, the uh, aorta, is made at, up of three layers. The intima, this is where the arteriosclerosis and uh, cholesterol deposition happens. Then we have the, the media, which is uh, the, uh, where the elastic fibers and the myofibroblasts, the smooth muscle cells, are located. And then we have the adventitia, which, where there are the so-called vasa vasorum, which supply the vessel wall with blood, uh, oxygen, and so on. We have uh, the outside, supplied by vasa vasorum, and the inside, directly by perfusion. But then we have the middle, the deep media. And the deep media is uh, affected by toxic agents and uh, by uh, infectious toxic, toxic agents. Uh, now, a hundred years ago, the uh, uh, necrosis, media necrosis, was very often seen in syphilis. Uh, it was infectious toxic, and it uh, also led to uh, rupture and death. And uh, uh, this is probably because this is the what we call Achilles heel of the of the aorta, where toxic agents may act there especially. And uh, there's also some kind of a food poisoning which is called naturism, which uh, by now we don't see very often. In, in my first years as a pathologist, I had a case uh, where I saw this. And it's also a toxic agent in some uh, plants, uh, kichererbsen, a kind of chickpeas which may be toxic. I suppose that this is a phenomenon which is uh, similar to what we uh, know have seen in the past. So, there's a toxic and maybe also immunologic attack in the area of the arteries where there's a weak point. And there may be local bleeding with hemosiderosis, iron deposition deposit, and there may be perforation. And there may be probably in many cases, small lesions may heal. I mean, but then the elastic fibers cannot be replaced by elastic fibers uh, once you are older than 15 years, let's say. And so there's a scar. 
And if there's a scar, the artery loses it, its elasticity. And uh, the, so the uh, rise in the blood pressure during contraction of the uh, heart is uh, very high and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down and it leads to uh, uh, probably uh, the, the brain uh, arteries are the most sensitive arteries uh, to, to uh, rupture and death by cerebral bleeding. And now my, my fear is uh, maybe in uh, somebody who has a, sc a scar in his uh, artery Maybe he will die in five years from uh, cerebral bleeding, but nobody will associate this with, uh, with the uh, vaccination, and uh, nobody will ex even examine the aorta, the, the, the main. Uh, this is not a standard uh, to examine the aorta. There will be a high number of cases where nobody sees any connection with the, with the vaccination, although it, it is probable. As Professor Burkhart mentioned earlier, damage to elastic fibers was also commonly found in the skin of vaccinated persons. He observed these changes in biopsies, that is, in skin tissue samples of living patients. Right now, I'm uh, systematically reviewing our biopsies from the skin, and uh, I have one example here, and you see on the left side, there's a very delicate uh, network of very fine elastic fibers. They are black. On the top is the epithelium of the dermis, and here you can see this man. He's 38 years old, and uh, he has a vasculitis of the skin. Here you can see there's these very delicate black uh, lines here. These are the remnants of, of the elastic fibers and there's no network below the basement membrane. Let's now shift our focus back to clots and we did discuss this a little bit earlier and I think that the topic of clots has received a lot of public attention and has generated a lot of public interest. I want to first clarify before we discuss a few images that there are two types of clots associated with the COVID-19 vaccines. Can you explain those two clots? Well, first of all, there's the uh, so you may call normal thrombotic clot, uh, which is formed by uh, thrombocytes and fibrin, and uh, which, uh, as I said earlier, is, uh, of course, uh, a kind of a healing of the traumatic events. I mean, if, if So you, if someone gets a cut? If you, if you cut your skin, uh, of course, uh, there will be a thrombo thrombic formation and then the endothelium regenerates and this is a, a normal process. So that's one type of clotting. That is yes. when, for example, somebody has a cut, it bleeds a little bit, but it eventually stops. That's yes. one type and that's considered normal. Yes. And the second type? Well, the second time is a, is a type that uh, has not been observed before, actually. Okay. And actually the first uh, Notice of this was uh, came from the United States. I personally have been in the United States and, and I was a, a guest for almost one year with an undertaker. Uh -huh. And actually there I got my first experience with dead people. And uh, I know that from that time nobody ever uh, observed uh, these uh, casts in the uh, in the vessels because uh, in the United States different from Germany where people are buried or burned they embalm uh, all deceased persons are embalmed and this uh, uh, makes it necessary to open uh, the uh, the uh, arteries or veins or and uh, put fixation fluid into the body, so the, the body is, is, is uh, embalmed. Soon after this vaccination campaign started, uh, there were reports from undertakers in the United States that uh, they observed these uh, very uh, strange casts in the blood vessels. 
They were long, elastic structures, not uh, adherent to the uh, uh, to the wall, so they are they they are not caused by normal vascular damage, and uh, they are very extensive. So, uh, just from the first report that I read this, I I, I was convinced this could not have been the cause of the death because. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if all your arteries are blocked, you would die before all this has formed. These yeah. clots formed post-mortem, after the, death. I, I'm absolutely sure they formed after death, and they were associated with the cooling of the body. Mm. All dead persons uh, have to be cooled before they are embalmed. These are the two things that I... Uh, stated they cannot have been formed intra vita uh, during life and they, they have been uh, formed by cooling. Now we come to the point that uh, uh, we have been uh, observing these phenomena in living persons and this is I think uh, something that uh, has not been uh, looked into before. In cases in which abnormal blood clots were observed in living patients, it is important to note that the clots were localized events and therefore more survivable. In this case, the patient is a woman in her early 40s who was an avid marathon runner. After receiving one dose of the Pfizer vaccine, the woman began to experience blood perfusion problems and sensitivity to cold temperatures. The uh, angiogram showed uh, double barreled arteries in the, in the legs. So this is the phenomenon that I described before, that uh, the media necrosis, in this case it was not in the aorta, but it was in the lower le leg uh, arteries. This lady was fortunately in, in a way that uh, the, this media necrosis did not rupture, but it found its way back. So it's well known that uh, there are two ways. Either if, if you have a dissection of the aorta of a, or a large vessel, there are two ways. Either it goes outside and you die by uh, bleeding, by, by uh, hemorrhage. And the other way is that it finds it, its way back at some other location and then you, you uh, have, uh, the circulation is again uh, possible, but uh, you have, of course, trouble with perfusion. And uh, this lady, actually, she was active marathon runner. She, was, she participated in marathon runs. And uh, soon after this uh, vaccination, she could not walk anymore for some time and had very severe problems. She did all kinds of uh, therapeutic me measurements like plasmapheresis uh, and uh, things like that. And she is better now, but it, it relapses. This is after the vaccination that uh, shows that there's a profound damage of the perfusion. I mean, she at some times she could not walk. She couldn't walk? Walk anymore, no. Wow. And 40 years old, otherwise healthy? Yes, as I said, a marathon runner. Now this is a, also yes. a point of interest, this yes. image here on the left, which shows the blood after it has been separated and cooled. What is this yellow structure yes. that we see at the top of that vial? Can you yes. explain what's happening here? Yes, well, let me first say this. She uh, had a biopsy of the skin, and in the skin biopsy we saw a vasculitis, we saw necrosis of endothelium, we saw uh, expression of spike protein. And uh, then she called me and said, well, the doctor took blood for analysis, centrifuged and put it in the refrigerator. And uh, the strange things happened that uh, in the upper part where the serum is, there formed this strange clot which apparently is not a thrombus because it's white, as you see, it's, there's no erythrocytes in there. And it, it is like a jellyfish and a little bit sticky. Professor Burkhardt also examined the clot under the microscope, which is shown here. 
He used a special staining technique that highlights fibrin. The extracellular proteins within the clot were identified with modern biochemical techniques in another laboratory. We found it was a, a almost cell-free uh, aggregation of small microfibrils, probably unmature fibrin. The, the thing is, uh, it's definitely not a, a normal thrombosis, and we have fibrin, which is uh, a constituent of thrombotic uh, of a thrombus. It's only on the surface. We have inside these small uh, uh, small fibrils, and this is the surface. You see here this uh, slightly bluish is the uh, are these very delicate uh, fibers. Mm -hmm which probably are, are some pre-stage of fibrin. Mm -hmm. Fibr uh, and uh, then on the surface, you see there is uh, only on the surface thrombocytes, there are some lymphocytes, there is mature fibrin on the surface, and which is most important, there are CD61, which is uh, a constituent of endothelial cells. So the contents of endothelial cells is, comes into the blood. And uh, uh, under certain circumstances, apparently after cooling, uh, these may form these uh, structures, these clots. Then we had proteinomic analysis done by uh, friendly uh, laboratory and they found that the proteinous uh, composition of the serum and of the clot differed. And in the clot there were 139 proteinous structures that were not in the serum. And these were extracellular matrix, collagen, elastin, and some other structures, especially CD31, which is uh, related to endothelial uh, uh, contents. We consider now, and we have, of course, we have to, we have more cases to examine. We have some more already now. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, concluded that uh, these clot formations are uh, an indication that the, that in the past there was an endothelial damage, and uh, if it's still forming, it's an ongoing uh, endothelial damage. And through the endothelial damage, proteins and matrix constituents of the vessel wall come into the blood and circulate in the blood. And uh, in cert under certain circumstances, they can form these clots. And you were seeing this in several people who were vaccinated, these types of clots. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. But uh, at, at this moment, we don't have a systematic evaluation, but uh, it's, uh, it seems to be uh, the case that uh, it is associated with vaccination. In all of your years of pathology prior to the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccinations, you did not see this type of blood clotting. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And actually, we have uh, one uh, specimen which uh, was uh, uh, taken from a person who is still living, and they did angioplasty, and they removed such a clot uh, outside of an artery. And this is definitely associated with uh, temperature, because uh, this lady especially, but I have heard it also from other persons, they feel or they have uh, ma uh, no major problems as long as the temperature is good. So, but if it's below 25 degrees, they, they have problems with uh, their uh, hands maybe. Uh, uh, so is it their circulation? Apparently, they have yes. problems in yes. the cold temperature, and multiple people who have been vaccinated are reporting this? Yes. Okay. Next, Professor Burkhart and I discuss his findings and his work more generally. He provides his perspective on the scientific community, academic science, and the public health industry. He also reflects back on his career and shares his motivation for doing this work. 
All right, uh, Professor Burkhardt, I just want to have a general discussion with you yes. about the findings, about your work. And, and first of all, I would just like to know to what degree of certainty are you able to show or that you can say that the damage that you have observed is associated with the COVID-19 vaccines? Well, as I said, uh, th there's not a single test or a single uh, histological uh, change or immunohistological change. It's always the combination of uh, all the findings that we see. And of course, we have to take into account the medical history. In these 75 cases, now we have uh, uh, 78% where we are certain that the death process was in some way uh, influenced by the vaccination. Now, this does not say that all these people died of the vaccination. It's a, a the death process is complicated. In, in persons over 50 years, of course, there's always a, a uh, there are many organ lesions that uh, can be made responsible for this, but uh, in these 78%, uh, uh, we are sure that it played a major role and that these people may have survived without vaccination for, I, I would say, at least six months. Nobody can, can say uh, uh, this exactly because nobody can see in, uh, into the future. Sure but uh, they would have survived for some time. Uh, by the way, uh, in our first pathology conference, we had only 15 cases examined, and at that time we came to the conclusion it is 80%, and now we have 75 autopsies examined, and now it's 78%. And this is an ongoing project? It's ongoing, yes. These uh, figures may, may change, but uh, the trend is obvious, and I don't think there will be anything that uh, uh, will prove us wrong. When you take a step back and, and look at all of your findings, what are the conclusions that really stand out the most to you? Just speaking generally, if you could just describe what is the most significant. The key is the endothelial damage and the uh, vascular and, and after the endothelial damage, uh, the vascular damage, which may be in the heart, in the brain, and uh, also in other organs, but these are the um, organs mostly affected. Now, some pathologists may be inclined to disbelieve your findings without independent confirmation. So has there been any other pathologists or medical professionals who have been able to confirm your findings? And if so, can you name who those pathologists might be? I have many colleagues which uh, confirm my findings. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, German pathologists don't want their name to be published. But uh, just to uh, name some international pathologists, I mean, uh, uh, you probably have heard about Ryan Cole. Uh, I have discussed with him in Vienna, in Stockholm, and I will meet him in Brussels next week. He sees the same things and, uh, uh, well, he made this remark which I can subscribe a hundred percent. He said, if anybody would see only 1% what I see in the microscope of vaccinated persons, vaccination would be stopped immediately. And this is 1% and I see 100% and he sees 100%. It's very important to highlight that there are many pathologists out there who are seeing exactly what you are seeing here. and. I'm very curious as to what you think we could expect in the future if we continue to vaccinate people against COVID-19 with gene-based vaccines mm. and with gene-based vaccines in general. What health complications and trends do you see uh, arising if we continue to, to go down this pathway? Well, I think this pathway has to be stopped immediately. Are there any other uh, health issues that you could see arising in the long term in someone who has been vaccinated? This refers to uh, 
problems that I as a pathology cannot see, but as a physician, medical person, of course, I have the very strong uh, suspicion that changes in the genetic construction of our cells will be changed. And I, this is something that has never been done in history of uh, mankind. So I think it's, it's uh, absolutely, uh, it, it, it has to be stopped at immediately. And uh, before, uh, I mean, even in my, uh, I, I, I just, uh, yesterday I read a textbook uh, that was uh, written by my teacher of pathology. And th this was in the 1980s. And he said, well, messing around with the, with the DNA is, uh, it, it has many pro promising aspects, but it has grave uh, problems. And uh, everybody must be very careful. And I cannot understand that physicians in uh, all over the world uh, uh, just ignore this and, and uh, believe uh, some people who say, well, this is absolutely without any uh, side effects. You have had a long and successful career in pathology. How do you think that we got to the point in which academic medical science is unable to understand and correct the serious mistakes that have been made with regard to the handling of the COVID-19 so-called crisis and also the COVID vaccines? I think uh, it must have been uh, in the 1980s that uh, the system of uh, recruiting university professorships uh, was changed. I don't know why and I don't know who, if there was any intention behind this or if this uh, just was a normal course of evalu evolution, I don't know. But uh, I'm definitely sure that uh, the generation of my teachers of pathology and medicine and uh, I may be one of the last of this, generation that they are that this was a different and critical uh, generation and, and now we have uh, what we call in Germany systemling as it's the uh, system conform persons and I mean, I mean everybody should have cried out when somebody says you never have to question this I mean questioning is the essence of any any science Actually, only now I have come to the conclusion that the uh, academic world has changed in the last 20 to 30 years. It's uh, completely different from the way it was when I was at the university. I would never think that my uh, teachers of pathology, uh, like uh, Professor Cotier, which is a very well known Swiss uh, pathologist, that they would have uh, in any way uh, uh, gone along with uh, all these things today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can only have the uh, notion that uh, something went wrong. Uh, and uh, the selection of uh, what was once called the experts has changed in the last years. Mm -hmm. So I shook my head already very early when in the television, so-called experts came out and say this uh, thing should never be questioned. I mean, this is uh, actually a, a person who claims to be an expert and a scientific person who says this fact <laughs> should never be uh, questioned. He does not belong to the scientific world, in my word in my uh, opinion. The so-called experts, I think they have themselves proven wrong. Uh, I, I, I mean, there are some people who, who said, well, very soon in, in Africa, when the, when the uh, COVID uh, so-called pandemia started, they say, well, people in Africa will die by the millions. And uh, in Africa, almost nobody dies of the COVID, but uh, here we do, uh, we, we had some. You know, and what were your thoughts about the so-called pandemic and the hysteria that 
uh, was being pushed onto the public in early 2020. I think a lot of viewers will be curious as to what you were thinking in those early months of, of 2020 when this was really being uh, reported on extensively in the media. Well, um, I, I, I did not panic at all. Uh, I, uh, there, there, there were a few weeks where I thought, well, uh, we should be careful. But uh, I think in March 2020, at that time, I thought, well, maybe it's better to be careful. But already uh, six weeks after that, I uh, heard the reports and I, it c became clear to me this is absolutely a, a fraud. It's, it's, uh, there's nothing to it. And I was never panicked because uh, as a pathologist, I had uh, autopsies uh, every winter of, uh, let's say, four or five people who died of normal flu. We did some uh, precautions, but uh, <laughs> we did not uh, 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 run around with mouse protection or anything like that, and we did normal washing of the hands. Now, early on during the so-called COVID pandemic, many pathologists were prevented from performing autopsies on patients who were suspected of having died from COVID-19, or COVID-19, the virus, was listed as the official cause of death. Why do you think it was that these pathologists were not allowed to perform autopsies on these bodies? <laughs> well, this is uh, actually a, a scandal by itself. This was the second point when I became uh, an unbeliever of uh, all this and I, I doubted uh, the, the uh, truth of all uh, things that were taught to us because if you have an unknown disease, the first thing that you do is that you order to, to uh, do autopsies. And uh, this is uh, actually a shame to all pathologists, especially in Germany. I mean, they should have gone, uh, uh, what do you say, I, I go ape, no? <laughs> <laughs> I get it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they should have gone to the government and said, this is, this is absolutely uh, uh, unscientific. And it was Corona in Hamburg, uh, Professor Püschel, who, uh, who said, well, this is not the way to do it. And he, he performed these uh, autopsies, although there was a, a recommendation not to do this. And he had some uh, very uh, good results. I understand that about a month prior to taking on this project, that is examining the autopsies in patients who died shortly after vaccination, as well as examining biopsies in living patients who were vaccinated, you were about to head into retirement. Yes. And you decided to take on this work without much recognition, without pay. You, why, are you, why are you doing this work? What motivates you to continue to do this? Well, it's, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, human responsibility. I mean, if I have the uh, knowledge and the education and the ability to uh, uh, see and uh, uh, make a diagnostic in the microscope and I see something that is alarming and that may be uh, a threat to, well, actually all humanity, uh, there's no way out. Actually, I did not know what I was going into, and uh, but. Uh, are you surprised by what you have found? Is it? Are you surprised by by what you have found? Well, yes, definitely. I, I never would have thought that uh, this could be possible. What you I, never thought this could be possible. Yes. Wow. I want to now discuss a few points looking ahead. Now, the damage that you see from the COVID-19 gene-based vaccines, would you expect to see that same damage with other gene-based vaccines that are not necessarily to protect against the COVID-19 virus? That's a difficult question. Apparently, in the uh, COVID-19 vac vaccination, uh, the main uh, 
harmful agent is the uh, spike protein. But uh, if you read or listen to my uh, uh, what what I uh, publish or what I uh, say, I always speak of spike associated damages because uh, I uh, I can I can see the damage. I can see there's spike there. But I cannot say uh, the damage is done by the spike. It could be that the spike is only one bystander and that the uh, lipid nanoparticles and other contaminations of the uh, vaccines are responsible. So uh, this is why I take this, I think, scientifically correct denomination, spike-associated okay. damages. Have you been able to observe, or rather, have you tested for harms caused by the lipid? Well, unfortunately, uh, 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 nanoparticles, as the word nano says, uh, they are not visible in the microscope. They are beyond the microscope. So, unfortunately, I cannot see them. Okay. And unfortunately, lip lipids are not uh, accessible for immunohistochemistry okay. because they are not proteins, but they are lipids. But uh, actually, uh, we do have some uh, not yet completely confirmed indications that uh, these uh, lipid nanoparticles may form crystalline-like uh, formations with cholesterol. And uh, uh, we see these uh, very strange uh, particles in some of the, in many organs of the deceased. And uh, this is one of the things that we still have to clarify. Uh, I cannot make a definite statement about this, but th this is something possible and I, uh, would say as soon as we do not have a clear answer to this, if it's only the spike or if it's other, especially the nanoparticles, every vaccination with this uh, modified messenger RNA should be stopped until we know more. What causes some people to have severe symptoms after vaccination and others to not have any symptoms? Yes, well, this refers to what you might call the vaccination paradox. There are millions uh, vaccinated and uh, for many times it was said there are no uh, side effects, but this definitely now has been re redrawn and everybody uh, admits that there are uh, uh, serious, even deadly uh, complications. Now, there may be uh, quite a, a number of explanations. Uh, one of course, uh, and uh, I hope this is the case, that the most or many of the uh, uh, charges uh, were not efficient, uh, especially if you look at these uh, vaccination streets, as we call them in Germany. I mean. They, they were not cooled properly and, uh, and so on. Then there may be some uh, charges that are different, different uh, so-called, uh, I think there's a, a website uh, about the charges that are especially... Uh, where's my batch or yeah, find my okay, batch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How bad is my batch? How bad is my batch? Yes, how yes. bad is my batch? Genau, exactly. And uh, then... Uh, I personally think that uh, the, uh, uh, it's a question where the injection was applied. Mm -hmm. uh, apparent, uh, I, I don't know if you uh, have followed this, but in, 19, in 2016, the WHO said that for vaccine injections, you don't have to aspirate to uh, see if you are in a blood vessel. And they argued uh, at that time that uh, children, at that time mostly children were vaccinated, that the vessels in children are so small that you don't hit them with the, with the needle. And it would be impossible to, uh, to do this. 
but uh, we measured the uh, uh, vessels in the uh, deltoid muscles and uh, the uh, easily a needle of the type that you use for vaccination easily can get into these vessels. So it's possible that some people, adults who have been vaccinated against COVID-19, the needle actually went into the blood vessel and yes. that is what's causing them to have a, a worse well, reaction? Well, yes. And then is it also too perhaps the amount of the vaccine contents that circulate throughout the body, would that also have an impact on how severe someone's symptoms would be post-vaccination? Well, I think it's, uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, uh, clear that if you uh, get a, what you call a bolus injection, uh, is, is very dangerous. Uh, bolus, uh, is, that means all the vaccine is uh, directly into the blood. I mean, this is, this is true for every uh, toxin and for every uh, uh, drug. Uh, the, the higher the concentration, the higher the uh, side effects. And this may be an ex explanation. And in February 2022, uh, this recommendation uh, by the WHO was withdrawn. And they said only for the uh, messenger and our vaccinations, uh, we recommend aspiration. And I mean, this is an admission that this is a different uh, vaccination than all the other vaccinations. Why would they make that recommendation? What was the justification for that? I personally think they, they changed their recommendation because in September we had our first uh, pathology conference and I showed the pictures where I showed that the needle could be easily put into the uh, uh, into the vessel of the deltoid muscle. But they referred to a publication from a Japanese uh, authors in, in the vessel and uh, the other group in the muscle. And uh, those that were directly injected into the uh, uh, vessels uh, had uh, myocarditis in most cases and died. And this was published in July 2021. In February 2022, they withdrew their recommendation and said, you, sh you must make aspiration. But actually, this was only a small notice in the ads in the German uh, papers. I, I would be interested how many doctors that do vaccinations ever took, took notice of this. This was just, uh, well, Feigenblatt, you say in German. It's uh, just a cover up. Of course, many people are hearing this right now and they are going to be wondering why. Why continue to keep these gene-based COVID-19 uh, vaccines on the market if they're causing this significant amount of harm. Why do you think that is? <laughs> That's a difficult question, which uh, uh, just have to think about it. Sure. But I think the, uh, the, the, the connection of political scientific and uh, uh, ideological aspects are responsible and uh, personally I cannot understand how anybody who ever recommended this uh, vaccine, this uh, mod mRNA vaccination can sleep uh, soundly uh, now. I, I would not be able to do this and I, I, only, I can only consider that they are afraid and uh, they, they do not have the courage to come out and say, well, I was wrong. Well, now I would like to give you an opportunity to address your colleagues, fellow pathologists, fellow medical professionals. What do you have to say to them? Let me think of okay. it. Well, I think uh, 
one of the things is always uh, question what so-called experts tell you. Because uh, actually before this uh, uh, vaccination campaign, uh, the word expert for uh, scientific person, I, I have never heard. I don't know uh, how you define uh, an expert. And uh, now that the so-called experts have, uh, prove, have been proven wrong in so many cases, and uh, even the general public maybe uh, not uh, believe in experts, now they have a new term, and they, uh, they call it top scientific uh, so and so top virologists, top pathologists, and I think this is not in the interest of the people. You don't need top scientists, you need soundly thinking people with experience, with patients, doctors that have experienced in their everyday life. There were people dying by the flu for many years. Nobody ever made a pandemic out of it and, and, and uh, locked people away because of that. I mean, I can very well remember that uh, there was some kind of a panic in Reutling in the 1990s because there was, was a seven-year-old girl dying and uh, an eight-year-old uh, boy dying of uh, of uh, the flu and actually at that time I did the autopsy and I tried to give the specimens to be examined by a, by a virologist and nobody wanted to pay for it. Actually at that time I had to pay for it myself. Uh, so something went wrong. and. Uh, well, you know what that shows me? That shows me that throughout your career, you have been making an effort to do what is right. And that's exactly what you're doing right, right. now. Even if it's difficult, even if you face challenges, even if there's no pay, right. you are doing what is right. Well, I think this is the obligation if you are a doctor. And as I said, we don't need any top experts that influence the politics. We need soundly thinking people with everyday experience with patients. It doesn't matter if, if they have experience with living persons or with dead persons as I have, but uh, I mean, I have a sound, uh, I think I have a sound uh, judgment about what is happening. And uh, the idea that there are some uh, uh, supernatural top, uh, top whatever experts, this is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, just, uh, I cannot believe that people uh, fall into this uh, deception. I would also like to give you the opportunity to address, once again, fellow pathologists and others who could help contribute to your work, perhaps help contribute with writing summaries or analysis of the work that you are providing. Do you have any message to, to others in your field? in our pathology conferences, uh, as we call them, mm -hmm. which are always uh, uh, reports of the progress that we made. We have uh, now uh, defined many uh, clear uh, de uh, lesions uh, and uh, we uh, put some uh, recommendations for procedure in autopsy and I would just suggest and ask that uh, my colleagues uh, follow these uh, recommendations. I mean, this is not a question of uh, how to do the work, but how to be responsible for the work that you do. What would you recommend that fellow pathologists watch out for? Well, we definitely have uh, some main and very convincing uh, uh, tissue lesions, and these are myocarditis, perimyocarditis, vascular damage, endothelial damage, and uh, uh, bleeding into vessel walls and in the brain, which may lead to death. 
And uh, in any case, if an autopsy is done, uh, the large vessels, and especially the aorta, should be histologically examined. And uh, generally, uh, an autopsy uh, for a supposedly new disease uh, can never be done without a histological examination of all organs. I mean, even if you think this is a clear-cut case of a heart infarction or whatever, or uh, brain uh, hemorrhage, you should examine the uh, other organs, uh, the, the genital organs. In some cases, uh, not even the spleen was examined. Uh, I mean, uh, autopsy is not only a service uh, to the uh, doctors who uh, were responsible for this patient, but it is a public service for the uh, for the for our health system what would be your final message here today taking a look back at all of your work what is a really important point that you want to leave the viewers with <laughs> just let me think a little bit mm -hmm. well Actually, the main point is uh, already said by uh, my colleague uh, Ryan Cole from the United States. I cited him and he said, well, if you only see 1% of what I have seen and please all my colleagues look and if you see this 1%, uh, you must stand up and say this vaccination campaign has to be stopped immediately and uh, there have to be implemented strict uh, regulation on any messing around with our genetic material. What keeps you going? What motivates you to do this work under difficult circumstances? Well, first of all, of course, I think uh, everybody has uh, a responsibility. Everybody is uh, today is calling for solidarity of our society. And I think the solidarity uh, uh, demands of you to uh, step forward and come out uh, uh, when you see something is going wrong. I mean, if I see a car heading for a child on the street, I have to do something. I cannot uh, just turn my back and say, well, bad luck. All right, Professor Dr. Arna Burkhart, thank you. Thank you. Professor Burkhart has shown very likely or with certainty the role of the COVID vaccine in causing death or disease in the patients that he examined. He dedicated the final years of his life to helping bereaved families and living patients who were seeking answers and not receiving them anywhere else. He inspired deep affection, respect, and admiration from the many doctors, scientists, and medical professionals who worked with him to stop the harm and death that was and is underway. It is now up to other pathologists to follow his leadership and bring the full truth to light. It is on the rest of us to support them in the endeavor. Professor Arna Burkhart demanded high moral and professional standards in the medical profession, and he himself set the example.